Today on Tips from the Top Floor, we'll have a look behind the scenes of how the Canon flash system configures and triggers flashes with nothing but light. And we'll look at a fascinating photo project about the Maori culture of New Zealand and their Tamoko. This episode is supported by Dougal, a legendary photo lab that is now at your fingertips. ShopDougal.com is the expanded online storefront of Dougal Visual Solutions, a leader and innovator in printing for over 50 years. At ShopDougal.com you now have instant access to world-class printing solutions such as HD photos and archival pigment prints, acrylic prints, canvas prints, metal prints, photo books and more and they ground ship for free. Give us your best work, we'll give you ours. Find out more at ShopDougal.com slash top floor. That's shop d-u-g-g-a-l dot com slash top floor and use promo code top floor at checkout to get 25% off your first order. This is Tips from the Top Floor episode 831 for Thursday, July the um, uh, 12th, 2018. Tips from the top, from the top floor, tips from the top, all right. from the top floor. Hey, hello, welcome, how's everyone doing? This is Chris Markward. You're listening to Tips from the Top Floor, the longest-running photography podcast on the planet. Um, I have two things uh, I want to talk about, and both are kind of, yeah, came across my radar. I, I don't do a news show here, and you know this, um, but those are two things that I found interesting. So I thought, why not put them on this episode? The first one is... Uh, a bit on the tech side, it's a it's an interesting look into how the Canon flash system works. And the second one is about an exhibition that has really touched me, even though I wasn't there. But uh, it's about New Zealand, and it's really really interesting. Um, let's start about uh, let's start talking about the the flash thing. Um, so there's this guy who uh, did some reverse engineering of how flash communication works. And while I knew how this worked, just in theory, it's a really cool look into the practice of things. And we're talking about the Canon flash system. Now, Nikon has had this for the longest time. The Nikon CLS flash system has always been known for firing flashes and uh, setting the settings on flashes using light as a communication vehicle. So there was this pre-flash sequence of things and that would set up the power and the duration or whatever you can set up on a flash and i think that's a really cool thing and uh, then canon while a while ago has added that same functionality so you can use a canon camera and it's built in flash let's see you have a 60 for example and you you can use that built in flash to trigger compatible canon flashes and it doesn't use radio communication it uses light and so what does this guy do and there's there's an article i'm going to link to that has a video that shows that um the way it does that is that it well let's let's put it this way the, the, the way the guy found out was by looking at that communication in detail and he first tried to do this with his smartphone the video in his smartphone set on high frame rate but that was just too slow it, he just couldn't really decode the the flash sequence this way and then he used a light sensitive uh, diode hooked up to an oscilloscope and that oscilloscope uh, would then show exactly how the series of pulses works and it's really interesting to see that series of pulses cuz it's not like rectangular pulses it's more like triangular pulses and that's because the flash has a fall off time so you have a a steep slope and then a, a, a bit of a softer fall off and that makes these triangle shaped pulses and uh, he uses an oscilloscope to record them and to make them visual for us. And you see that series of pulses and then he decoded those by trial and error, by seeing what change in my settings on the camera results in what kind of a different series of pulses. And it's pretty much, it's a digital code. It's ones and zeros, on and off. And there's a rhythm to it. So you you can kind of count uh, the rhythm and... Um, uh, there's interesting stuff in there. I think the whole thing kind of starts, every sequence starts with a sync pattern, which is always the same as a series of ones and zeros. So the, the the that's probably what the flash is looking for. Do I see this pattern? And again, this is within milliseconds. It's so fast you can't see it. Um, the flash looks for that. And if it sees that sync pattern, it knows, it synchronizes with that and it knows, okay, now I'm supposed to 
uh, listen to that, but it doesn't listen if it's not on the right channel because part of the stuff that follows encodes the channel that you can uh, put those flashes on. So it sees the sync pattern, the flash sees the sync and goes, oh, that might be for me, and then follows the channel encoding and then the flash will go, oh yeah, that's really for me, or no, I'm not on the same channel, I'll ignore the rest. Um, then the, 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 the signal encodes the output strength. Is it at full fire or at a half of the power or a third or a, a quarter or an eighth or a sixteenth and so on? And then um, I think that's all it, that, that's all the system needs. And then there is a, a, a pause of a specified length. I think there's something like 55 milliseconds. And then comes the signal, now fire. And the flash has been prepared and it sees the, it knows what to do. And then it, all it does is wait for those 55 milliseconds. The trigger signal comes in and then it fires. If you use any other trigger signal, like if you use another flash that, that, that just sends the trigger signal, the flash won't do anything because it waits for that specific synchronization pattern and the channel and output strength encoding. And then what this guy does is he builds a trigger. He built a trigger himself using an infrared LED and an Arduino and um, and emulates what the cameras do and fires the flash with that. And I think that is really amazing. I mean, it's not if you've ever done something like that, this is not super hard to do, but uh, just to see someone actually do it and go, okay, let's dig in and it's not as hard. It, it really shows you that um, <laughs> we have a German saying, these guys use water to cook. They, 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 they are just uh, just normal thinking people. There's, there's no magic behind this whole thing. It is an interesting um, way to do it, but it's probably how uh, the average engineer would uh, would design such a system and it works like a charm. So uh, if you are a maker, if you, you, if you want to do something like that, you know how he, this guy posted and published uh, his findings so the signal is decoded. Uh, you could now just create your own Canon flash trigger because the protocol is right there at your disposal. Very cool. Another thing that I found interesting uh, this week is an exhibition in New Zealand. It's called the Puaki Project. And uh, <laughs> it took me a long time to find out why it touched me so so deeply it's a photo project uh by a photographer called michael bradley and he did portraits of uh maori people and he did some video interviews with them and it's an interesting project for a okay the way i got interested was because of a technical thing that's not what i stayed for but it just got me on board because technically it's really interesting. The Maori have a tradition of, it's a tradition, probably some deeper meaning in there that I don't know of, but they have this tradition of tattooing their face. The, the tattoos, I think, are called tamoko. And um, for a long time, that was not kind of, they, they didn't do this anymore. But now uh, that, that's kind of coming back as a sign of pride and identity i think i believe um but the problem is back when it was like really everyone did it it was not really well documented for one reason because when photographers tried to photograph the tamoko uh those tattoos they used back in the mid 1800s they used wet plate photography and wet plate isn't sensitive to some of the frequencies of the of the spectrum that those tattoos are in so pretty much uh, wet plate photography turns the tattoos invisible. They're just not there. They don't show. And uh, photographer Michael Bradley recreated that with a, with a wet plate camera, with a tintype camera, a collodion wet plate. And uh, then he also took pictures of them with a modern digital color camera. And uh, he also gave them, he let, let the, the people decide how they wanted to be photographed, what they wanted to wear, what they wanted to, how they wanted to pose, everything. Um, he just kind of documented that, but in a really beautiful way. It's very well lit. It's they, they, These portraits have a real depth to them. And um, that's why I stayed. And I looked 
a bit deeper into that. And the, I think it's 48 photos out of that that are now on exhibition um, in the uh, Konagu Museum of uh, Waitangi in the Bay of Islands in New Zealand. That's very far up in the north. I've looked it up on the map. And uh, th what really then reeled me in was the videos that accompany that. The photos themselves, comparison side by side of the face with the tattoo and then the the tin type without the tattoo is is in itself really interesting, not just from a technical point of view, but the way the, the tin type renders skin tone is just, there's something magic to that. It brings out a shine on the on the face and it... I just like the way it looks. It's very different. And uh, the videos that now, this is my highest recommendation, uh, not just for the photography, the videos themselves are lit as well as the photos, very beautiful. Um, but for me, it's a really amazing glimpse into a different culture and in a very different way. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to put in words and I thought about this for a long time, but you know, when I travel... I get glimpses into many different cultures, uh, be it in the Himalayas or in Ethiopia and Africa or in Norway or in Russia. But there's something fundamentally different here. And it's interesting because the videos, watching some of those videos created a feeling of, I don't know. First of all, we're, we're looking at very proud people and it created a feeling of closeness, some form of familiarity that really touched me. Um... And again, it took me a while to find out what it was. I'm really not exactly sure yet, but I think it is. Uh, it has to do with the language. The connection has to do with the language. And Maori have their own language. At least I think they do. Some of them, some of the videos start with uh, with that language, which in itself is f fascinating to to hear and to see someone speak. But that's true for all languages. I'm I'm really fascinated by watching. Uh, people who don't who speak a language that I do not speak I, I, I love to watch them to hear them to watch them to, to hear the melody of their language um, but then the Maori in those videos they don't speak this as a second language but it's it's English it's okay it's English with a New Zealand accent but it's English and because I speak English and they speak English um it creates an interesting closeness that I haven't really felt with a different culture just yet. Um, and while, while they use some words that I'm not familiar with, I think that adds to this to this feeling of, um, yeah, strangeness and closeness at the same time. There's some local terms in there that I have no idea what they mean, or I can try to kind of guess what they mean, but I'm not sure. Uh, maybe some are borrowed from the Maori language, I don't know, but that's still creates for me creates the, a very magical level of of difference and closeness at the same time and it really fascinated me that feeling fascinated me so again michael bradley created these portraits and not just on wet plate but also in color with a digital camera of both side by side there's that exhibition up in the north of new zealand that kind of puts them side by side and as a as, as Monica and I are planning to go to New Zealand early next year, um, we've put that exhibition on our list. It's just a really fascinating project. I'm, I'm interested to see if any of you get that same level of fascination that I get. Um, I'd really be happy to hear from you about that. Let me know. Send me an email. Send me a voicemail about it. Uh, voice at tfdtf.com. That's where you can put that. And um, I'd be... I'd be really curious about what you think about this it's at puaki.com p-u-a-k-i.com again p-u-a-k-i.com uh, check it out let me know what you think <laughs> whoops sorry for the interruption this just in um has to do with libra pay and if you don't know what it is, this is the donation platform that I've been using for a few months now and some of you use libra pay to, to donate to tips from the top floor and other creators, which I highly appreciate. You're awesome. But <laughs> Liberpay has just posted about something that is throwing a bit of a wrench in their works. And um, it's about their payment processor that has apparently just kicked them out. 
and apparently without warning and on short notice. So I think it's they'll be in with that processor for another week or two. But there's some urgent action required now. Um, they seem to be quite overwhelmed by this, which... Um, anyway, um, it means that there will be some disruption to their service, to the Libra Pay service, while they find a new payment processor. And uh, the reason I bring this up here is because of the model how Libra Pay works. Because you as a patron who donates through Libra Pay, you will have a wallet on their service. And typically... The, the system works by uh, you put some amount of money in that wallet, like let's say $20, $50, whatever, and then tell uh, LibraPay which recipient gets how much per week. That's pretty much the model. And uh, that saves a lot of the fees and makes everything just a bit smoother. And then that wallet is apparently held with that payment processor. So long story short, if you use LibraPay to support people like myself, you now need to do something um, I hate that, but that's just the way it is right now. I either withdraw the money or donate it to the recipients. And there's a Medium post, uh, a post on Medium that LibraPay wrote with details about that and they explain what's happening. Um, I will link that in the show notes. And again, if you if you donate through LibraPay, please give it a quick read. This is kind of urgent. Anyway, all right, second try. Okay, that was it for this episode of Tips from the Top Floor. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this. A bit of a shorter episode, uh, but again, let me know what you think about the the Puaki photo project from New Zealand. It really fascinates me. You, you probably can tell. And if you're looking for ways to support the show, again, tfttf.com slash support. Just at this point, LibraPay, probably not the best option. Music for the show by Jeff Smith, Silent Partner, Hans Peter Kagrut Publishing, and Slack Challenges by Release Pixie, Matt Revsitar, Armstead, and Slack Invitations by Chief Invitation Officer, CIO Rusty Russ. The link to get on the Slack is in the show notes. My name is Chris Marquardt. You'll find me on social media at Chris M A R Q U A R D T. Go out and take amazing photos. Be nice to each other and happy shooting. <laughs>